Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Helen McShane, and I'm the Director of the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre, and I'm Deputy Head of the Medical Sciences Division. And I'm delighted to host today's COVID conversation. I'm really pleased to welcome Melinda Mills, who is the Director of the Oxford Leverhulme Centre for Demographic Science. And she has led some work which has just been published around the effectiveness of different face mask coverings um, that I'm delighted to say she's going to talk to us about today. Melinda. Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you today with the title Face Masks Work, and I hope by the end of this uh, around 15 minutes uh, you'll agree with me about the evidence that we're about to produce. So it's about a report um, that I uh, wrote together with uh, several of my colleagues that um, for on behalf of the Royal Society and the British Academy. And this was face coverings for the general public. We talked about behavioral knowledge, effectiveness of cloth coverings and public messaging. That's available online and you can access it, access it if you just search a few of those uh, keywords. So I think it's first important to talk about what I mean when I'm talking about face masks and coverings, because there's generally a lot of confusion around it. So I'm not talking about, you know, these sort of respirators or the surgical masks. I'm talking about cloth face coverings that the general public can use. And I think it's really interesting when you look internationally at what's happened, um, there's been really different sort of take up across the world. And that's one of the things we looked at in this report. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why that might be the case, because there was a lot of inconsistent and changing nature of the, the sort of policy information there. You know, but as of, uh, you know, the middle of June, most countries actually required masks or coverings to be worn in the general public. In fact, even after a few days when the WHO announced the pandemic in March, um, around 70 countries already, you know, had told um, their population that they should be wearing face masks and covering um, when they go out. And there's a real variation in policies if you start looking at it, where the mask should be worn, should be worn in all public places or on transport or in shops or in restaurants. And there's a lot of confusion and differences across countries. And I think, you know, what's interesting is there's no, clear policies or recommendations in some of the Asian countries that experienced SARS or these other respiratory uh, pandemics before, but actually they have universal use uh, and, and take up of people wearing masks and face coverings. So this just shows the rainbow literally of the different sort of non-pharmaceutical interventions across different countries. And this is results from a survey that was an international survey that was conducted by the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research and they were uh, shared the data with us. And this just shows different things such as distancing and this shows their compliance from 0% up to 100%. So people have been generally compliant with distancing, hand washing, a lot of uh, people have avoided uh, trans, uh, uh, tra public transport, used hand sanitizer. But what's interesting is we see a lot of cross national variation in face mask uh, usage and take up. So this is actually conducted by the end of uh, April in 2020. And there were a lot of countries such as Italy, the US, Spain that already had by the end of April, you know, they had no culture of wearing face masks or covering in the general public, but they had a huge take up of uh, people already wearing uh, face masks and coverings. And I'll, you know, unpack that a little bit now and talk about why that might be the case. And I think another important thing that when you look at this graph, you should realize that face masks and covering are not, should not just be thought of alone, but they're part of, a, part of a policy package. So they don't substitute social distancing or hand hygiene. So why has there been so much confusion and debate? Well, there's two main reasons. One is that the policies have changed across different supranational organizations and across different countries. But there was also a lot of confusion and discussion about the scientific evidence. But what you'll see here is, you know, as I, I said before, a lot of countries that had previous experience with SARS, there was universal mask wearing. On April 3rd, the Center for Disease Control in the United States said that the general public should be wearing masks and face coverings. And that was based on evidence that they felt that a lot of people were walking around and were asymptomatic and they could be transmitting the virus with not, with not, and not realizing it. So for that reason, early on in April, um, they already said that the general public should be wearing them. But then on April 6th, the World Health Organization said that healthy individuals you know, do not need to wear them in public. That created confusion. 
The same thing, the European Center for Disease Control and, and Prevention in early April also said that there was no evidence that people should be wearing them. The Scottish government, although they didn't mandate it, said um, already in April that people should, they're encouraged to wear face coverings. But then the World Health Organization on June 5th did quite a large U-turn and said, no, the evidence is quite clear now that the public should be wearing and uh, governments around the world should be recommending that the general public wear face coverings um, in public where they specifically when they're in crowded places and can't social distance. And as we know in England, um, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, there's been a huge difference um, in, you know, the policies even within this, uh, you know, uh, even within the United Kingdom. So, uh, you know, on June 15th, um, it's in public transport in England, the Scottish government on July 15th said people should be wearing coverings in shops. And <clears throat> as of Friday, that will be the case in England in um, shops and supermarkets. So there's been a lot of confusion and the public um, actually is, you know, rightly confused about, you know, what is the science behind this. So we wanted to look at this report and try to understand and unpack what is the scientific evidence? Like, do they protect you and do they protect those around you? And why is there so much discussion about there being no scientific evidence? What we found is we did a really large systematic and broad literature review. And we graded it also by, you know, standard systematic review criteria that you can find in the report about the quality of the evidence. What we found is that a lot of the evidence relied only on medical literature and they missed some of the material sciences looking at different fabrics, but they also missed the behavioral and social science literature. A lot of them only looked at recently at SARS or uh, you know, at uh, um, COVID-19 literature and they missed some of the earlier lessons that we can learn from previous pandemics. What we also found is that when people were talking about scientific evidence, they were often talking only in relation to randomized control trials. So that's where you compare something like a pill, is it effective in one group in comparison to a control group that doesn't get the pill? Well, face masks and coverings are a behavior, so they don't really um, uh, abide by this sort of strict randomized control trial. And um, for that reason, you know, this is a, any study that wasn't a randomized control trial was often being discounted. So that was the reason why there was so much controversy around the literature. So we decided to engage in a new meta-analysis of cloth, uh, cotton masks. So that would be what the general public would be wearing. So we found all the existing studies that were available that were high quality enough where people were wearing a cloth mask and where it was compared with a group of wearing no masks, so a control group. And what we found is they don't provide 100% protection, but actually they, um, you know, our meta-analysis showed that masks actually, you know, uh, provide 54% uh, lower odds of the infection. Now, of course, some caveats, which we clearly state in the study is that this was conducted, you know, in relation to, um, you know, different viruses. It was um, in one area, in one region, and in healthcare settings. But at least, you know, even within this healthcare setting where you would be uh, exposed more often um, to viruses, it really appeared to offer um, protection um, for those workers. So that should suggest that when you're generally in the public, that it should offer you some, not 100%, but it does offer you some protection. So what about those around you? Well, once we go into the materials literature, we can see that there's actually been studies that have tested. So this is all the different kinds of fabrics. So you have cotton and chiffon or cotton quilt. Um, you have your N95 respirator. You have a surgical mask. And you can see that this is the sort of efficiency in the, in the filtration of them. And you can see that the fabric's really important. So if you have a high quality fabric or a multi-layer fabric, that will really you know, result in filtration. But also it's important that you don't have a gap. These ones that show problems are when even it's a good high grade, a high grade uh, resp respirator, if you have a gap and you don't wear it correctly, that's a problem. So they protect you and they protect others. So what are some of the social behavioral factors? So why is there this big discussion that people may or may not wear these face coverings? Well, here's some lessons learned from pandemics. First, there's public indifference. Second, it's the personal characteristics. So you have to wear the mask or the face mask. And it's really, these respiratory infections are really, um, you know, uh, highly infection, highly infectious. So you might think, yeah, okay, that's recent evidence. 
but that was actually published in 1919 in relation to the um, Spanish flu. So what we realized when we dug deeper into the literature that, you know, it's pandemic 101, many of these things and these lessons learned, and we simply need to look at what many other nations have already, um, you know, learned and followed from previous pandemics. And there were some social behavior factors that were really key to public uh, adherence to whether you want to wear a face covering or a mask. The first thing is quite simple. People really need to understand why they need to wear it. So you can't just tell people, put it on. You have to understand it protects me and it protects others. And people are often confused as well whether they have symptoms or not and their inability to self-diagnose. So, you know, just giving them clear information about how it works and how it could protect them and others is, is key. The other thing is risk perception. Individuals just underestimate their health risks. They think it's probably for vulnerable groups that need to wear it or outside of where they live. And that became very clear in our literature review following multiple pandemics. The other key factor is, has the nation had some previous experience with pandemics? And we see from the infection and the death rates and the track and trace systems from countries that actually experienced pandemics before, they were quick and rapid and they introduced multiple interventions uh, immediately. But social political systems are also important, and I'll show you in a moment. You know, can, can uh, countries uh, have a coordinated act action? Does the public trust actually the government that's giving these um, uh, regulations? And in polarized political systems, such as the UK, um, the US, and Brazil, we've seen, you know, people go into different uh, uh, places where they get their knowledge, and that has affected this as well. Also individual characteristics, I'll show you in a moment, you know, we know that younger individuals and men have lower uh, compliance to these non-pharmaceutical -pharm interventions. Finally, perceived barriers. Um, you know, people really have to understand that they're not competing with surgical masks and they really have to understand sort of the basics of uh, how to wear these face coverings and masks. So I said earlier that I would uh, talk to you a little bit about this. So what happened um, particularly in England, but also in some other countries is, you know, if the face covering and the mask issue got mixed up. It's a public health uh, message, but it got mixed with supply issues. So people thought, well, I shouldn't be wearing, um, you know, face masks or coverings because I'll be competing with PPE or this, uh, this uh, protective equipment. And it also got mixed up in some countries with a civil rights issue that it was, you know, you're right not to wear a mask, but it's a public health message. And it's interesting, you know, people aren't talking about your right to wash your hands, you know, so uh, um, for some reason, it's really uh, uh, taken this turn. And this was in the Financial Times, you know, just showing different groups that are less or more likely um, to um, say that they're going to be wearing uh, masks. And we see this mirrored, the same sort of groups in these political divisions um, in the United States as well. Um, but we see um, as public leaders, such as the very late adopters, such as Boris Johnson and Donald Trump start wearing masks and you know, uh, being a role model, people start adopting across multiple groups, uh, wearing these um, face coverings. We also focused on this support, uh, report about the importance of clear public messaging. So, this just gives you an example that I pulled from the 10 Downing Street um, uh, Twitter, you know, and it's, it's really unclear to people. And I think we have to be clear, you know, this shows a, a older person, um, uh, you know, wearing a scarf, that's a least effective cloth covering. Um, it says when you go to the shop, but maybe not in the shop and, you know, and it, it focuses on protecting others and not yourself. So we really have to focus on very clear, consistent, easy to understand public messaging. And people really need to know some basic things. So these are the questions I think that are really important that from this review that we're able to pull out, people have to know what to wear. And I showed you some examples. They need to know when to wear it um, and where to wear it. So, you know, in indoor confined spaces and in crowded spaces, the England, for example, as of this Friday, will be instituting a law where people wear them in supermarkets and shops. But the immediate question that comes out is, well, do I have to wear it in a restaurant? And, you know, it has to be quite clear for the public. And the public's savvy and smart, you know, and, and they'll follow things when they understand them. We can take examples. So Japan, for example, had the three C's. It also has to be easy to remember, you know, when you're in closed spaces, crowded places, closed contact settings. 
you know, that's where you need to, um, you know, wear don your uh, face covering and just try to avoid those situations. And it's interesting, there's multiple reasons. It's not just face coverings, but Japan's had around 1,000 deaths and a population of 126 million. So it's something to think about in terms of, uh, you know, many of these factors. People also have to know how to wear it. So just some simple instructions. And they also need to understand who cannot wear it. It's really key that some people with physical and mental disabilities and children are just unable to wear them. And we have to make sure that we counter discrimination for those groups. So just to conclude, you know, the key takeaway, and I'd love to talk to anyone that's, uh, you know, wanting, wanting to have some exchange on this, is, you know, our evidence shows that cloth uh, face coverings are effective and, you know, the World Health Organization and others are now backing that more recently. They protect you and they protect those around you. And these behavioral factors are really vital to understanding, um, you know, why we have to understand why people wear masks. And they're just part of public uh, uh, policy packages. And it's really important that we just are really clear about these factors. So I thank everyone for, for joining me for this and I'll turn it back over to Helen now, I think, uh, for any questions. Melinda, thank you. That was a fantastic overview of what is clearly, clearly an enormously complex area. And I think it was great the way you highlighted some of the sort of chronology of this over, over the course of this pandemic. I think the geographical differences are really quite striking. So there are a, an enormous flood of questions already. Um, so I'll go straight into those um, and I'll try and group them. So the first one, okay, let's start with a nicely political one. Um, so this is Brian on YouTube saying, can you cast any light on why it was that the government initially thought that the science had concluded that face masks were not effective? Oh, Brian, that's a really good question. So <clears throat> it comes back to the point I was talking about, about um, a lot of governments were, you know, being advised from a different group of scientists. And a lot of them, um, you'll see that the across the different governments, they were getting different scientific advice. So obviously, in the beginning, medical uh, scientists were really important to provide advice. But they have specific expertise. A lot of them are relying on randomized control trials, saying that scientific evidence is randomized control trials. All evidence outside of that isn't valid. So, you know, as I said just quickly during my presentation, it's really hard to do a randomized control trial on the general public on who wears a mask and then have a control group that doesn't. First, there's ethical issues because we know that masks are now protective. So, you know, there's ethical issues of having people not wear them. There's also really practical issues. People take them off and, you know, and, and they're not compliant in different ways. So it's not a clean randomized control trial and it can't be looked like at a pill. So we looked at other um, studies that had been looked at during, you know, SARS and MERS and previous respiratory pandemics. Um, we found that, you know, and what I mean by behavioral and observational studies are surveys, people going out into the field, you know, collecting data that are not randomized controlled trials, but scientific evidence with statistical tests and everything from these groups in the community. And actually they were showing that these were um, protective and it resulted in people, um, you know, protecting themselves, but more importantly, not transmitting um, the virus outside. So, you know, the, the sorry for the long answer, but, you know, the answer is, is that scientific evidence isn't just randomized control trials. And I think, you know, that's happened in a lot of these sort of behavioral um, factors. So it's something that we can learn. And it's something I'm afraid that other countries already learned um, during previous pandemics. Right. No, well, that's that's very clear, isn't it? I, I think the importance of looking at all the evidence is, is clearly important from your work. So, so, so question here, um, well, two questions that link. One is the indoor-outdoor debate, and are masks as effective in, in both settings, or is, is one better than the other? You talked about the three Cs in Japan. Um, and then the other one is, is, is really related to that, is do you think that uh, masks should be mandatory everywhere? Yeah, so... Manda mandatory is a very strong word, of course. Yeah. So, yeah, so let's, let's do the indoor-outdoor and then the, 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 the mandate. Um, so the indoor outdoor, I think, is really important. And that's why some countries have just been really clear, uh, you know, for the example I gave you about Japan. Like, so it's when you're um, in a confined space. And we know from some recent studies, too, 
that if you're in a restaurant, it actually depends on the, the um, ventilation and, and different factors mm -hmm. as well too. And you could be more susceptible if you're sitting in a certain place in a, in a restaurant as well too. So indoor spaces, it makes sense to, and uh, many countries have now introduced those policies, indoor spaces, because it's quite clear to people. So you go into a shop, you probably can't maintain the two meter distance, or as they have it in other countries, the one meter distance, or in Canada, the hockey stick <laughs> distance. Um, you know, if you can't if you can't maintain that, you know, then that's clear to people. But some other countries, and I gave you some examples. Um, so, for example, uh, for Japan, for example, if you're on a crowded street or if you're in a crowded market, you're outdoors, but you're in close contact. Mm -hmm others. So that's why some countries have just tried to think of, you know, the three C's, you know, yes. or something like that. So, you know, it's just kind of logical. If you can't yes. maintain that distance, then, you know, you should be wearing a, a, a face covering. Now, mandatory or not, that's a really interesting question. Um, so, um, uh, because um, some countries have introduced fines and some haven't, and some have introduced recommend recommendations and mandates. And, you know, I think if you introduce um, a fine, then it's very clear to people. Um, that's one argument for it's because it's very clear to people, I should wear them. But then you run into the problem of who's going to enforce this. Okay. Shopkeeper, is it the restaurant owner? Is it, you know, and, and, and yeah. go on. Do the police have to be called in these situations? So actually what has been shown to be more effective as well too is just sort of social norms and mm -hmm. people understanding the virus and the altruistic nature of like if I wear a covering I'm protecting my grandmother and my neighbor and my, mm -hmm. my and my other people so so um you know and and I think it's really important that our public leaders and uh are wearing you know, <laughs> that are engaging in proper you know examples of wearing uh you know face coverings when they're in close contact and in in, in close settings which happened really late in some countries yes. I don't need to name them probably <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's absolutely right. I think leading by example is 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 really important, isn't it? And just and and that, as you say, the sort of peer pressure and the and the social gentle social pressure to to feel you are behaving as a as a good citizen, I think, will be important. There are lots of questions, and I'm just going to pick out a few on design of face masks, which you talked about a little bit. So, really, questions about you know how many layers, what materials should materials be alternated. How do you fit them? Um, you know, how, how can we really make sure that if people are going to the trouble of wearing a face covering, it is the most effective? Should there be a single design or, or a sort of set of recommendations about, about design of these? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that some countries have already introduced some really clear designs or mm -hmm. sort of clear mandates, and they're actually regulating it. Um, but you know the other ones that previously went through other pandemics did this actually quite a while ago as well. <laughs> so we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Yeah. But I think that that's just a key question, and those are the questions that that you know we're all wondering and we're, we're um, you know getting asked. So there should be some clarity. I know on the government websites here, but also um, around you know. So I've looked around the world at the different government um, recommendations, and some of them are just really clear and accessible. You know where they show you if you want to make it at home how should you make it um and should it be adjustable and you know it's really important to have that right fit that you don't have gaps mm. but you know as the person also talked about it's important that you have um as well the proper fabric so um for example i was looking in um just uh, july 17th the updated uh advice on the government website in england says you can wear a scarf <laughs> So, and scarves can have big holes in them yes. too. So, so we really have to be clear about this. So there's, there's a reason why people are asking. So the study that I showed you showed that really high quality thread count cotton can work. Mm -hmm. Multi-layer is the best, but it can still breathe. You know, when I was talking to one of our nanoparticle specialists here at Oxford, and he was saying that silk and the electromagnetic relationship with that is really important as well too so we really need a joined up it's not just medical it's behavioral yes, exactly it's material science it's understanding the fabrics that will really get us further um, into this so so just to really be clear about this um cloth cloth face coverings are fine but they should be a high quality fabric 
Multilayer is the best, and you can find um, information on various government websites about that um, around the world, or our report talks about them as well, too. And the fit is really important. You shouldn't have gaps um, around. And if it's a thick scarf, you can wear it, and there's ones that go around your neck. Um, you know, those are all, those are all uh, good things that you can wear, and you can make them at home as well, too. Great, thank you. Well, that's that's very clear advice. So, I mean, moving on to fit, and you're absolutely right, fit is important and gaps are bad. One sees a lot of people walking around with masks that seem to be covering their chin rather than their mouth or their nose, which which clearly is, is not terribly functional. So what happens when people put their mask up and down or they take it off, they put it on to go to shop and then they stuff it in their pocket with their handkerchief or whatever? And, you know, are we worried about contamination? How often should these things be washed? And, and what is the kind of good mask um, or what is, what is good face covering etiquette to make sure that it stays uh, a useful tool rather than one that actually increases viral spread because it's contaminated? Yeah, so that's a big discussion that, that's been taken. And I found it quite interesting. It was taken, well, people won't wear them properly, so we just shouldn't mandate it. Yes. <laughs> And I, for that, that, I found that an interesting one because, um, you know, no, we should, we should actually provide information. You know, the, the general public wants to get out of lockdown and get their lives going and they don't want to you know, get the, get the virus or give it to others. So, so they, they will be, you know, compliant and under, you know, if they understand why they need to do it and, and, and factors like that. So I think there's been a lot of confusion about mask, mask and covering etiquette mm -hmm. and, be cleared up. And there's some, some good examples. The Center for Disease Control in the US, um, you know, has some very clear examples about okay. um, uh, rewash and reuse. And I hope that other governments will follow and just be really clear um, about it. So if the mask starts to get wet, for example, it becomes less effective for filtration. So you have to think about that. Um, a lot of questions that people ask about are if you wear spectacles or, or eye mm -hmm. and that they fog up. Well, if you have a wire, um, you know, yes. within your mask, you can actually put it under so it doesn't fog up. So there's all those sort of practical things. And people are saying, well, I've got a manual job. Like, how am I going to do this? And, you know, and these, these masks, um, um, you know, they do, they, they do allow for breathing and filtration um, um, as well, too. But I think it's those kind of things that just have to be made really clear to the public so they understand mm -hmm go through all of your examples. But, you know, if you take it off um, and you, you know, uh, uh, you shouldn't be constantly touching your face, but once you get used to it, and once you have the mask on, um, you'll notice that you actually don't realize you're wearing it. So you see a lot of people that have masks on and they're driving in their car alone. And yes. <laughs> they yes. just have forgotten that they have it on. And once everyone around you is wearing one, yes. it becomes quite socially acceptable. And Absolutely to wear one so um but i think the first question people are asking about is this use and this comfort and uh, absolutely and that's logical and they haven't been given much information in some countries mm. yes you're right it almost become needs to become such normal behavior that then it's it's you know it's socially unacceptable not to wear one and and that's that's where the behavior may change so there are a few questions here about children and obviously the guidance is children under the age of 11 do not need to wear a mask and that's for a whole complexity of reasons and we know that children um, are, are the least likely age group to suffer severe disease with COVID anyway um, and we have a question here in particular from Caroline on Facebook who says as a shielded teacher being asked to return to the classroom in September with no children wearing masks will a mask protect me enough? Yeah so I think those are really the, the kind of like on the ground questions that people mm. have information about um, we can think about the school situation. So what Caroline just asked is a really good one. So in some Asian countries, you know, well, a lot of them actually had experience with SARS, it's both the children and the teachers that are wearing um, face coverings. So that could be something to think about. Um, and also, um, you know, it's down to these closed contact confined settings. And I think it's also been um, relatively unclear in some countries, including, for example, in England, about you know, when people go into a shop and they have to wear them, well, what about shopkeepers? <laughs> you know, yes, exactly. Um, and if they're behind uh, a plastic, you know, uh, sort of covering, like, should, should they be wearing them? And, um, you know, an interesting study that was published um, that tracked uh, um, two hairdressers, for example, they were both COVID positive. 
And they had strict regulations where they wore masks and their clients wore masks. And they traced um, the, the, they were able to trace most of the cases and they were able to, to test them. And they found that um, even though these uh, two hairdressers actually um, uh, were symptomatic like early on and they had um, uh, COVID, none of the people that they tested actually contracted it. And I thought that was, you know, that was really interesting. Center for Disease Control of the US that was published um, last week. And, you know, so that just shows that you, if you have this two-way compliance, getting a little bit to Caroline's question that, you know, the client and the hairdressers both wore them very consistently. Um, and these were cloth coverings. Um, you know, that's important. And I think we have some, some real confusion here about the shields. Um, yes. Will allow, uh, you know, uh, particles to, to, to fly out and the, and the coverings themselves. So we just need some clarity. And I guess we just need to catch up with some other parts of the world that have experienced this and know. Yes, yes absolutely. Certainly one goes into shops and hairdressers and sees shields that cover the eyes perfectly and, and barely the nose and certainly not the mouth. Right. So um, difficult to see how they are, are terribly useful. So Melinda, that's been a fantastic kind of tour de force through this really tricky but critically important area. Perhaps we can just finish by getting your kind of bottom line comment on how can we encourage behavioral change? How can we how can we encourage, coax, cajole people to understand that you know this is this is an important public health measure that it complements the others. You said that very nicely, like hand washing, like social distancing. It's not an alternative to those, but it is complementary to those. How can we try and maximize uptake so that we truly together then minimize transmission of this virus? Yeah, so I think it comes down to, you know, the, the, the scientific evidence is clear now. So we have to move away from that discussion um, because, uh, you know, we, we know that it's protective and, and it won't harm you, you know, unless, but there are some people that can't wear them. That, that's very clear. We have to be clear about that. But um, I think we have to think about it um, in the same way that we think about hand hygiene, you know, that, that you can... Mm -hmm. It's unhelpful to think about it in relation to civil rights. This is public health. And um, so, and I don't think, you know, necessarily people need to be conjoled. You know, they were, they were, people stayed in isolation for, for weeks and months, you know. Yeah. So, so the public, I think this fear or this myth that the public won't comply um, doesn't hold. We've seen in many countries that they've adopted um, uh, wearing face coverings very rapidly. And the key is that the public needs to understand why. <laughs> and once yes. they understand yes. why, and we just treat our public like the, the you know, um, sensible people that they are, um, people will start wearing these um, and uh, even without uh, mandates, you know, but just Lovely. really clear on, on the effects of them. And we have to be role models as well um, from our, for, from our yes. lead all the way down. Yes. Absolutely. So it's about education of, of, of the importance of them and, and very clear messages on, on yeah. what to do and what to wear. No, I think that's that's very clear. Well, look, Melinda, thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure that your mailbox is going to be even fuller than ever after this <laughs> talk with people bombarding you with questions. But thank you for really discussing such an important area with us and talking about your research and congratulations on, on such an important work. Um, so I'd like to thank Melinda, but I'd also like to thank all of you that have asked questions. It's been a, a really great session. Um, I'd like to just flag that, uh, as with all these talks, we're just using these, uh, this opportunity to illustrate some of the work that's going on in the university. We have a huge number of researchers working across a, a wide range of projects, um, and all donations of any size are very welcome to support this work. There's a a link at the uh, bottom of the, of the page, web page on this. There will also at the bottom of the web page be details of the next talk. Um, and uh, I hope you can join us again for, for that. Thank you all very, very much for listening. And, and Melinda, thanks again for, for such a great talk. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.